I'd, I'd love to explore that theme a little bit more with you. As you know, this is the Vandenberg Lecture. Uh, we we um, want to explore themes that were important to Vandenberg. We were chatting earlier with with uh, Hank Meyer, and you know, in in Hank's book about Vandenberg, he really has a wonderful description of the transformation of Vandenberg from a very staunch isolationist and a real partisan to somebody who worked very closely with FDR, with the administration on the whole post-war uh, order, NATO, Marshall Plan, the, the Truman Doctrine, the, the, the engagement of the United States in the world. It's kind of hard to imagine that kind of dialogue uh, today. How do you, is there a chance and, and how would we pursue that chance to take this moment of pretty good bipartisan consensus on Russia's invasion of Ukraine and build out a more bipartisan consensus on foreign policy? A great question. Look, my core concern is the sustainability of unity within the United States uh, and unity in the West, whether it's NATO, uh, NATO's European partners, uh, or all of the uh, Western uh, nations, the free democratic and open societies that have come to Ukraine's aid, uh, and our partners around the world that are also joining us in, imp in imposing sanctions on Russia. So we shouldn't forget that the South Koreans, the Japanese, the Australian, uh, others, although not yet um, the Indians, um, we have a challenge in that um, there is a united approach uh, towards Ukraine by Western democracies. But there is a significant uh, sort of arms folded kind of wait and see response from a significant number um, of African countries, uh, of South Asian and Southeast Asian countries, um, who frankly view this more as hypocrisy, um, that in their view, the United States and other Western countries mm -hmm. have not provided the same level of support, of engagement, of concern uh, for conflicts uh, on the continent of Africa and Middle East that we are for Ukraine. So first, um, there is significant unity uh, in Congress uh, and in the West with regards to how to respond right now to Ukraine and Russia. One of the reasons that Vladimir Putin really thought he would get away with this uh, with very little consequences was that after his invasion of Georgia in 2008 and his uh, invasion of Moldova, uh, his invasion and occupation and annexation of Crimea in 2014, and then of the Donbass, mm -hmm. um, the response from the West uh, was tepid, was divided, was unequal. And a lot of that had to do with domestic political concerns and with economic concerns, especially on the part of Germany. Um, I think one of the key issues in the West is Chancellor Schultz and the new government in Germany and the dramatic shift in position they've taken. Um, in Europe, this frankly has allowed us to, to move past, for the moment at least, some of the real divisions uh, between the UK and the EU over Brexit uh, mm -hmm. and between Poland and the rest of NATO over some uh, really misguided and inappropriate decisions by the Polish government in terms of journalistic freedom, mm -hmm. uh, support freedom. I was in Warsaw meeting with the Polish government three days before the war began, and they are suddenly completely focused with us. That's NATO and, and Europe. Let's talk about here in the United States for a moment. We similarly are going to struggle with retaining focus and attention. Syria and the Syrian civil war was no less brutal or tragic. And yet the American people, after being riveted to the suffering in Syria for the first year of that war, gradually drifted off and became less and less motivated or concerned. I'm very troubled, Michael, frankly, by recent polling that suggests um, that the war in Ukraine and the defense of freedom in Ukraine doesn't make the top five in terms of identified what are the most pressing concerns in your life for a majority of Americans. They're more worried about inflation, about the economy, about the pandemic, about crime, uh, about the border. Mm -hmm. um, so bluntly, sustaining this focus, particularly as we move into a midterm where control of Congress is going to be at issue, mm -hmm. is going to be a challenge. And hopefully you won't accuse me of being overly partisan. Um, there is also a significant challenge here in terms of the political views, the global view of our former president, um, who has repeatedly and publicly said congratulatory and laudatory things about Vladimir Putin, and there is an upcoming election uh, in France where the second place candidate, the one who might, she has probably a one in five or two in five chance of winning, has a comparable view, has a long, close relationship uh, with Putin and Putin's Russia. So holding us together in the United States, holding us together in NATO is going to take leadership, 
leadership that I believe President Biden has shown and is capable of sustaining, leadership by uh, the leaders and the, the strong voices in our caucuses, uh, in the House and Senate, um, and frankly, I think Senator McConnell is an internationalist, is someone who believes in NATO, is someone who believes in our defense of the West. But let's go back to Vandenberg where you started. It's going to take some vocal, risky steps by some uh, Republicans and Democrats uh, to challenge uh, our parties and our administration to be more united and to be more forceful in our response to the ongoing developments in Ukraine. Um, Congressman Meyer is one uh, of a dozen uh, House Republicans who uh, made a very tough decision um, and is uh, facing some political consequences as a result. Uh, Adam Kinsinger is someone I've traveled with and worked with and admire. Um, and it is um, regrettable that um, his political career is certainly taking a sharp turn. Former Senator Jeff Flake of Arizona is someone who I traveled with regularly, legislated with, deeply admire. He is now our ambassador in Turkey. And for him, the breaking point with the former president uh, was in no small part his view of our alliances, mm -hmm. our values, and our priorities in terms of the defense of freedom. So um, I know that was a long answer. I think we could weld together a bipartisan consensus, but it's going to take a lot of work. And this is exactly one of the things to which I dedicate my time in the Senate uh, and where I am hopeful that members of the Armed Forces, Intelligence, Appropriations, and Foreign Relations Committees um, will be actively engaged in the weeks ahead.